welcome to AT&T Threat Track for June 30th, 2015. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Uh, today, we have a very special program because, first off, let me introduce our guest. We have Tony Tortorici uh, online with us. He's our uh, email expert, so glad to have him with the show. Uh, welcome to the show, Tony. I'm glad to be here. All right, thanks. And also on the couch, I have uh, Matt Kaiser, one of our regulars, uh, security analyst uh, extraordinaire, as I always point out, as well as uh, Stan Nurilov, uh, one of our other frequent uh, contributors to the program. And I'll also mention that this uh, episode is our 150th episode. Uh, so in celebration of the 150th episode, uh, Stan has pointed out that we're going to add a leap second to the calendar tonight, right? <laughs> so this is June 30th. I guess there's a, a leap second today. Uh, but in reality, I think we might do a little bit more acknowledgement of our uh, milestone here next week when we have Brian and Jim on and whatnot. We want to get all the regulars on. So in any event, um, welcome to the show. And uh, I'm John Hogeboom, of course. So let's uh, move into the first story. And uh, I think, Matt, you were looking at this first one here. And it's... Um, uh, APT Group is exploiting Adobe Flash Player, not necessarily a new thing, but maybe a little bit of a twist uh, yeah. or some new stuff going on in this one. So this is an interesting one. Um, another Adobe Zero Day, you know, mm -hmm. who knew? You know, it was one of those, one of those major, major plugins that always seems to get popped all the time, but this one's a Zero Day. Uh, Adobe has pushed out a patch for it. Uh, FireEye actually did the write-up on this one. They did the research. The group they're calling APT3 or UPS, which is a new name for me. I hadn't heard that. Not to be confused with the United Parcel Service, of course. Right, some uh, other, whatever, UPS Whatever it stands acronym for. for I, could, I could speculate, but I don't know. Right. Um, but they were the ones responsible for the Clandestine Fox uh, campaign okay. a while back, and this new one is being called Clandestine Wolf. Okay. Now, uh, it, I did a little bit of reading, and it. it's, it's interesting that the, the people who are using this attack, um, they're using the zero day you know, against the browsers, but in order to bring people to the site, they're using uh, phishing emails, but the phishing emails seem to look a lot like standard garden variety spam emails. Interesting. Which is kind of, it's, you know, I think that I would think that most people at this point have kind of moved on and can say, okay, this is, this is clearly spam. I'm not going to waste my time, you know, looking at it. People would probably delete that rather than click the link. But, you know, if, it's, if it seems to work for them, eh, I guess it works. Uh, like I said, Adobe's pushed out a patch for it. Um, and other people have been seen using this exploit in the wild. So it's not exclusive to APT3. So okay. it's about time that people should start patching. Uh, and then Adobe actually released their patch. I believe it was out of band for this one. So it's critical. It's, you know, game over. You, you get complete control of the machine when you, when you are able to successfully exploit this. Right. So if you can lure somebody to go to a website and get Adobe Flash Player to run, they've got this older version. They could have a drive-by kind of exploit there that's going to I think it's actually us. for the, the almost newest version, as, except for the, those who have patched. Right, so right, it's, right. It's pretty current. And I think, Stan, didn't you potentially might have seen one of these in some of our analysis? Uh, not necessarily an APT variety, but you said it's being used by other actors out there as yeah, well. Yeah, I think uh, we recently saw a drive-by, a potential drive-by, that had a flash vulnerability, actually, and in the end it delivered an EXE file. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But it was interesting. Uh, to explore. Flash is still going to be around yep. for a while. Um, although it was interesting, there was an article I think in the last week where Brian Krebs had said that he tried to go a week without using Flash at all in his browser, mm -hmm. just as an experiment to see if it was possible in today's age. And it turns out that for the most part he could. It was only like two things that he actually needed to use Flash for. Two very specific videos on certain sites. Right. I mean, right. when you've got YouTube having moved on to HTML5 video and most of the other pr providers going that way as well, I think it's it's a good sign. I know that Adobe's business partially relies on Flash, but the security community has kind of been hoping that we wouldn't have to worry about Flash vulnerabilities in the near future. Right. Well, if that goes away, I'm sure there'll be some other plugin. Oh, sure. We know there's other ones out there like Java and whatnot that frequently get targeted as well uh, for zero day exploits, you know, where they find these vulnerabilities and whatnot. Um, all right, so yeah, interesting story. And I guess uh, most of the victims they were saw were in the US and UK in like the defense and aerospace, mm -hmm. telecom, you know, all those industries we normally see get targeted by some of these nation state actors looking for theft of intellectual property. So mm -hmm. um, if you haven't updated, I would highly recommend checking that out, making sure that uh, you either update Flash in your enterprise or uh, have it disabled so that you can prevent it altogether. All right, uh, thanks for that one. Uh, so the, uh, the second story uh, of the day is one that you were looking at, Stan. 
regarding um, uh, an app maker who maybe was taking a few liberties uh, within his app and not telling his users? Yes. Uh, it's an app that, that was in the Play Stores, uh, in I think several of the major ones, and you know it was even advertised and things like that, and basically allows you to play games and get points, and then you get rewards for your points. You know, and there's always these terms of service that everybody just clicks through and uh, doesn't really pay attention to. In this case, though, there was some additional functionality in the app that wasn't really disclosed in the terms of service, and that's that the app maker was really uh, mining uh, cryptocurrencies, okay. uh, various different ones. Not the not Bitcoin, but the other secondary ones like Dogecoin and uh, Matt. I think is going to correct my pronunciation on that one. Uh, it's it's debatable. Dogecoin or or Dogecoin. It's it's, it's an internet joke. It's another yeah. cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. <And anyway. laughs> yeah. It's. I think it came from a meme like in 2014 or something yeah. like that. We're always aware of these uh, apps that are out there that you know seem like they're giving you something for free, but this one just had something that was you know, useful for the developer. One of the problems for users was that it was running their battery dry, or even when the phone was uh, charging, it wasn't charging as fast as it could have been. So it was a lot of these unadvertised features and things that would impact the user, but they wouldn't know because it wasn't disclosed in the terms of service. Right. So it's always important to read the terms of service so you understand it. Yeah. But in this case, I think the problem was with the app maker not putting the terms of service in correctly. So these terms of service are really complicated. A lot of people just click through. Um, but yeah, I guess the bad guys would be covered if they just put it in the terms of service. Right. Was <laughs> there, uh, well, not that we're, you know, saying we, we would know legally whether it would or not, but um, it's just kind of one of those questions. Like if, if it was, would that have protected him in any way? I guess that yeah, would be my question. That would yeah. be debatable still. Right. Uh, the, I mean, because then you get into these other things, right? Like, what if he was doing the, you know, they have some of these other uh, things for doing uh, processing to try to cure cancer or search for extraterrestrial intelligence, things like that, that are kind of like these crowdsourcing type of, you know, application things, which is not necessarily, it's for the greater good. Bitcoin mining obviously isn't. It's for one person's good. But um, if you didn't disclose that, would they have ad aggressively, um, you know, pursued him? I, I guess the problem is if you're duping consumers into something, uh, that that's the real issue. Yeah. Did they mention in the article how many uh, devices were infected with this or impacted? Uh, no, actually they didn't. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just curious if yeah, it was mentioned. And I didn't or not. look it up. All right. Well, I guess long story short is, although it's not very easy to figure out, it's a good idea to know what your apps are doing. Um, but unless you're really a hardcore hacker or you're watching all your network traffic, you may not even know. Especially with this thing, it might not even be very network noisy. There could be a lot of Bitcoin processing that was happening exactly. on the handset for long periods of time, and then it only would sh shoot out a, a message every once in a while over the network. So you might not even know. But you know, these days I probably expect that for most things I download. Mm -hmm. is that, yeah, my data is going to be used, especially if you're downloading something for free or you're getting some kind of value out of it. There's almost you know nothing that I would download that I would expect to get for free. Something is happening in the background. Right. 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 So. This is just one, one of those cases. All right, uh, thanks for that one. And so moving on, we're gonna go to uh, our Threat Track Top 5. And this week's a special week because we have Tony on, our email expert. So we have uh, for uh, our Threat Track Top 5 uh, this week, it's Tony's Top 5 Email Threats. Uh, so uh, how you doing, Tony? Why don't you take it away and uh, let us know what those Top 5 Threats are and we can discuss it. That sounds good. Uh, thank you guys for having me on the show today. I really do appreciate it, especially the uh, 150th episode, so rock on. My, my top five uh, threats are all around email, but basically just want to throw out there that, you know, every day there's always new and emerging threats and dealing with like drive-by downloads or, you know, uh, remote access tools, so on and so forth. So there's always bad out there. Mine, my list is actually geared uh, towards the volume that I see with my daily research with email threats and you know it's looking at everything it's it's the thought of you know it's an oldie but goodie kind of pops into my head um, so start off with my number five is password protected files in, in emails in the beginning of uh, 2015 actually for the past six months we've seen over and over and over again um, emails coming in with password protected files that have the password in it 
gives that sense of, you know, this has to be legit because it's, no one that's evil would, would do something like this, and it ends up being evil. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that lately, um, ebbs and flows, but uh, emails that are containing password encrypted files that are are bad. I mean, this stuff isn't isn't good. So when, um, when they do that, are they like having an attachment with a password protected file, but then in the body of the email they say the password is whatever, so that the user knows? Absolutely. Uh, that's that's the way they did it five seven years ago when when it was a, a bad threat, and uh, you get an email. It's got an attachment. Oh, it's password protected for everyone's security. Password is password or something like that and right. people will just open it up and they'll click on the document or whatever is inside and boom they're infected this is a good strategy to protect the malware from antivirus as it's running through the network it's going to be scanned but as soon as the AV platforms hit a password protected file they can't open it so they just move it along and it's it's a really easy way to get something bad all the way to, to the endpoint for the human being to interact with. Right, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, right, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, a, a machine or a computer is not gonna know, hey, they, they put the password in here, I'm gonna, you know, figure out how to unzip it and then analyze it. Um, so yeah, it gets right through to the end user at that point. Uh, exactly, I, there's been technology in the past that have, has, you know, they've done that, uh, I don't see that a lot. So pulling this old one out seems to be very effective for the people that are uh, behind the scenes in this. So my next one is another oldie but goodie. Uh, back in um, you know 10 years ago, macros in, in Word documents were really nasty. Uh, you know, someone could put some sort of malware in a, in a macro and someone's oh, they open it up and boom, all of a sudden there's an infection. Now, for years, that was really quiet. And for the past six months or so, I've seen a constant flow of macros coming across. Again, it's an email coming in with a, a document. And when you open it up, it says, oh, you, you need to enable a macro for you to be able to see this, the information inside. And as soon as someone does it, they're infected. So it's another one that's old school. And I think my, my theory on it is a lot of people nowadays, um, they forget the old, old tricks. And as, as we can all attest to, old tricks still work. Yeah, and I've seen with these macro ones, I agree, I've seen them a lot lately. And it's even, it's so overt, because they'll have a Word document, and then it'll actually have like a big like red and black arrow pointing to the, like the top of the screen where the button is to enable macros saying, you know, Make sure you click on this button that's up here at the top of this document in order to see everything in the document. And I guess there's a lot of users out there who just don't know that that could be potentially dangerous to enable that. So. Exactly. And it, it, it goes along the, um, you walk into an area and you say, don't push the big red button. A lot of people are going to push the big red button. I mean, it's just human nature. Yeah, it, yeah. I'm yeah. tempted. Yeah. I think instinctively when you see the, the directions like that, you're like, oh, I got to follow them. This looks so official. I better click that button because I better see all of that stuff. I think there was a pen test that uh, Matt and I ran uh, some time ago, and that strategy worked wonders for us. Oh, yeah? If you just make it look like they're supposed to do it, people just people follow instructions. It. People just follow the instructions. Okay, well, I'm going to tell everybody to think before you click. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they do. Maybe they'll learn something from this. But uh, So what's, the, uh, what's your, uh, top th uh, your number three one that you have on the list there, Tony? My number three isn't a method like uh, password protection or macro, but it's actually a Trojan, and I think it's pronounced uh, Upatre. Right. So basically this Trojan, uh, it's being used quite a lot, and it's being used to hit you with my number two and my number one uh, threats, but basically this is a first stage infection. Um, it was seen, it started to kind of come up around 2013 uh, towards the, the end or the fall of the black hole exploit kit, but basically this is a first stage infection. Once it's on the machine, then it goes out via either an IP or U a URL or something like that and downloads the real infection that the bad guys want to put on the machine. So that's been flooding emails all over. Um, once I get to number two and number one, you'll, you'll understand why. 
But yeah, that's that's my number three threat. And uh, Stan, Matt, is it called Upatre? I've, I've, is that the I've, right term? I've, I've, I'm not sure. It's one of those things that you see written all the time but never pronounced. I typically say Upatra, but uh, okay. uh, I've been on conference calls where people have had the same discussion. You know, The long and short of it is it's basically a dropper, right? So it's what we call a, a dropper where it's not really necessarily malware. I mean, it is malware itself, but it's not really doing a lot of criminal behavior. It's mostly going out and fetching other pieces of malware, like Tony was saying, and then dropping those onto the system. So it's really an end to a meme. I, I, would, I would slightly disagree. I think oh. the dropper is the initial payload, and then sometimes you have a secondary payload, and then you have your final payload. We're talking about step two in the middle here. Okay. And I think, and I don't want to spoil my next story because I'm going to get into a little bit more about Upatra, but um, I think what happens with Upatra is typically that gets downloaded, um, and it, it's part of some sort of decision or, or resell point where um, People who are infected with Upatra can pay for infections of their own malware to be pushed as well. Oh, okay. So I, th I think that's how the ecosystem works, where you get infected with this, and then someone's rented, you know, this percentage of Upatra will become Drydex, or this percentage will become Dire, or okay. whatever it is. It's a business model that allows you to be able to slice it that way. All right, well, hold off, because okay. I know you have a story specifically on this, but let's, uh, let's move along. So uh, what's your number two there, Tony? Well, Matt just mentioned both number one and number two, so I'll just kind of throw them all, all together, but it is uh, Dire and uh, Drydex. Right. These two, I, I can interpose them, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're both, both the top ones that are currently being seen. A lot of people call them spyware. It, to me, it's, it's just malware. I, the only thing this stuff does is bad. Um, but it, it looks for banking information. So if you get infected with this, it's on there, and each one has sort of different, you know, methodologies but behind uh, getting the data. But basically, what it wants to do is steal any information that it can and try to obtain your credentials for banking, and in essence, steal your money. So either number one or number two, I don't care how you want to grade those two, except they're both the top on my list. Okay, right, yeah, and these have been probably two of the most prominent banking Trojans um, in the past six months to a year, probably even around that, I would say, time frame. So, um, I would say probably since the, the game over Zeus takedown, the last big Zeus botnet, right, these right. guys, I think, have taken the top spot. Right, and Dyer also goes by the name Dyreza, Dyreza. as well, or Dyreza. I don't know how you pronounce any of these things. I wish they'd make them... They should have a key. Somebody should have that out on the internet, a pronunciation key for well, malware. First, we've got to standardize the names for the malware across all the vendors. And right. Then we can figure out how you're supposed to pronounce each one. <laughs> right, right. Um, all right. Uh, so that's a very, very good top five. I appreciate you bringing that to us uh, and the dangers of your email. Uh, so these are things people should be looking out for because I agree, these are things within the past few months, six months, half of this year that are really kind of the trends of what we've been seeing a lot lately. I know you deal with it on a daily basis, so I appreciate you bringing that to us. Anytime, guys. Okay. The uh, next story, kind of uh, pivoting, or what do you call that, leading into, or from, uh, from Tony's story, uh, so some, there's some people using hacked routers to serve up Upatre, or however we say this. Yep, so okay. I'm going to go with Upatre. I'm going to stick with that. Okay. Uh, so. Great article from uh, Brian Krebs from Krebs on Security talking about apparently there is a new variant of Upatra, which as we said is the, the, the second stage payload before you get Dire or Drydex, uh, which is being served up, the downloads being served up from infected routers from Ubiquity and Microtik, which are okay. sort of prosumer at the bottom end of pro um, router hardware. Mm -hmm. which is interesting because as far as I know, you usually see these devices being compromised for completely different reasons, you know, to take part in a DDoS botnet or, um, yeah, mostly for DDoS botnet activity, I think, is what we've seen. Yeah, I mean, I know we've seen Lizard Squad, right? They, mm -hmm. they harvested a lot of these home routers for that purpose, um, but I'm sure there's some other things. I've seen, we've seen all kinds of little things. And traffic manipulation years. and other little things right. like that, like you replace the DNS settings on it and, and everything else goes to a controlled server somewhere right. else. And there was actually somebody actually uh, sidetracking, but uh, using it as a uh, landing zone for phishing pages and stuff. So well, this actually is, this running is, a web server on it. This to, is probably the closest to that, but they're not serving the fishes from there. They're serving the malware download itself. Okay. So it's it's. I think that the the point is is that you're they're 
they're being treated more like regular web servers, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, you may as well treat them like that anyway. But it seems like with your, your case and the case I'm talking about here, you're getting more to that space where it just, you treat it like a compromised web server and you upload your files and you use it as hosting instead of using it as an attack platform. Or, or anything that's very specific to like a Internet of right. Things so device. So it's like a malware distribution method yep. with a whole bunch of these probably that you have and maybe having a directory of them or something. I don't know mm -hmm. how they're doing it, but a lot like that's that. The idea. So this this came out of, um, and it's, it was sort of hard for me to find a really good primary source on this. Krebs is usually reliable. Um, and um, there's a guy from the Fujitsu Security Operations Center who provided a couple quotes for the article saying that they're seeing this in the wild. Um, and it's specific to uh, Ubiquity Air OS devices and then mm -hmm. Microtic. I'm not really sure what operation, operating system. I've seen system. a lot of compromised Air OS yeah? routers. <laughs> yeah, and for something else that we were looking at, like okay. one of those other ports that was scanning a lot, I believe I saw a bunch of those devices as part of that. So it might be related somehow. Uh, I just don't remember. It was distributed between the two countries. One in the U.S. and one Could in be, the I don't remember. <laughs> you know, we have to go back and look at all my notes. Uh, there's so many different ports and protocols that it all turns into sludge in my head over the months that go on. Anyway. So it's, it's not clear uh, quite yet why these devices were compromised. I looked at the Krebs article and I found the actual, uh, the man who was quoted, I, I, feel, I think his name is Brian Campbell, I'm, and he has a blog as well, but there wasn't too much more detail in the blog post that I read. So... I'd like to know more personally. If anybody has more information about it, I'd love to hear about it because this sounds pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, but in general, the, the steps you should take are keep an eye on the devices you're plugging to the network. Just because it's not a, a regular home router that we've heard about, you know, your Linksys, your Netgear, the ones that typically get popped all the time because they have default passwords. Even if you're running the, the prosumer grade hardware, you should be aware of this stuff as well. Don't hook it up to the internet if you really don't have to. Make sure you're not running on, you know, leaving Telnet open out to the outside, Sing things like that. Right, or the web interface. Or the web interface. Right. In, in, in general, if you can avoid be having it be managed from the outside, do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting trend, uh, I would agree, because these devices, you know, they could, you could, do, like you said, you could run a web server, a bad guy could get on it, run a web server, distribute malware, distribute whatever, you know, it could be, uh, could be any kind of material could be distributed from that. Um, and you could use it as like relay points, you know, so you could, if you're a bad guy, you could use these to have netcat tunnels and mm -hmm. stuff uh, to kind of hide your traffic as you go along and stuff. And the users that are the victims that run these home routers may be none the wiser. Sure. Uh, because it's at the perimeter of their network. You know, unless you're really watching what's leaving your router, which most people don't do, they're usually watching kind of inside your own network because it gets a little tricky to do that, uh, watching it on the outside. But um, uh, so, you know, unless you're like one of us who's kind of, you know, maybe more hands on doing that kind of analysis, most people would not know, you know. So um, I wonder if there's a competition between the adversaries, the bad guys to take control of these routing devices that are out there. You know, the one guy wants to use it for distributing Direza, the other guy wants to use it for an attack platform. Uh, do they ever compete for the same router? And if so, like, well, how do they do it? That's interesting. It's, it's like, we've seen it, I remember seeing it back in the day with, um, with IRC botnets that used to have code in them that would look for the five other most popular IRC botnets and completely wipe them out when they found the machine and, you know, take over that one and then chain up to their own IRC, you know, command and control. Yeah. I, I guess that, that probably hasn't gone away. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've seen some families of these. I can't remember the name of the one family I'm thinking of that Lizard Squad was kind of using. It's not um, Dara Laws or Moon or any of those IoT no, ones? No, it was one of the other ones. I can't remember the name of it. But I think it looked for these processes that might have been uh, also on the system and tried to kill them. A lot of these ones, if you ever looked at these home router infections, Usually when they get in there, they get in, they drop the malware binary, and they run it, and then they delete it from, from the system. So it's only running actively in memory, and you won't be able to actually find the file on the system because it's only active in memory. And then, you know, most of these devices stay online for an extended period of time, so they don't really have to worry about it. Uh, so if it reboots, they just have to find it again and reinfect it, run it, and then whatever. Uh, so that's one of the advantages for the attacker is that these devices don't reboot a lot like a home computer would, potentially. Um, so they can just implant it once and it probably stay up there for weeks or months at a time before anybody notices. Um, 
But I have seen some cases where people try to either get in, delete other people's malware that they've deployed, and, uh, and then try to protect it, like clean up the hole that they used to get in so that nobody else could get in and take it. Uh, of course, most of these things, they're firmware devices, so they reboot and they're open again to the next person to go. Yeah, get I'm not it. sure that's the case with these two other devices that we're talking about in this case. I, 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 know. I wouldn't say definitively that they're you know, the firmware only type. I think they might actually have some persistent storage. Oh, really? But okay. I, I, should, I should probably look into that before I make that a statement. Okay. All right. That would be interesting to find out. Um, okay. Thanks a lot uh, for bringing that one. That's, uh, I think that's an interesting thing. I've always kind of been, we see a lot of these Internet of Things devices in our scanning activity reports, which we'll talk about uh, upcoming. But um, so it's one of those things that it's important for people to know about and and pay attention to what we're saying and make sure your devices are not exposed to the internet and open for anybody to hack into them. Um, because it makes our job easier if it's, if it's not uh, hackable. So on the lighter side, we're gonna finish up with Stan's story before the, uh, the internet weather. And I guess someone got a little, uh, got a little trigger happy <laughs> with uh, one of these drones. Yeah, it looks like, you know, we always hear about drones interfering with like airplane routes or firefighting missions where they have wildfires and people want to like tape or using a drone what's going on but in this case i guess it was a, a friendly not so friendly <laughs> uh, dispute between neighbors where uh, one neighbor was really just on his property and flying his quadrocopter didn't have a camera or anything like it you know he just set it up and was flying it in this open space and all of a sudden it comes crashing down. He hears a, a loud bang and boom, it comes crashing down. And apparently it was close enough to the property of some other neighbor. You know, these are big spaces though, but it was close enough to some other neighbor's property that he thought it was, he mentioned it was a, he thought it was a CIA drone or something like that, a surveillance drone, and he shot it down. I mean, even if it was one, I don't know that you'd be, you'd be able to shoot it down. I'd, I'd probably be a little scared to shoot down like government property. Um, but, and they had just this dispute. It was actually interesting because I think it was on Ars Technica. They actually have the email exchange that went on between the two gentlemen. Um, and it's interesting just to read the way they politely communicated back and forth who would pay for the damages. What was interesting though is when they went to court, the guy whose drone had been destroyed was using GPS logs from his device to prove that the device or this, this helicopter wasn't really ever on the other property and so you know the other neighbor was li potentially liable for right. these uh, fixing it fixing it up and sh shouldn't have shot it at all right I would suspect even if it was in his neighbor's airspace discharging your firearm at something <laughs> I don't know I have a feeling that that I don't know maybe it's because I'm in New Jersey and we're so <laughs> we live so close together but I would suspect that might still not be a good justification. <laughs> I think you yeah. probably still have to pay for the guy's drone. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing I thought was interesting is he thought the CIA, the CIA had a drone following him. Just the fact that if that's really true that he thought the CIA was following, then I'd be like, well, what are you doing? That, that you would think the CIA would be so interested in watching you. So that's a little, I don't know. Yeah. You know? And, and who shoots down the CIA? Yeah, why would you shoot down the CIA drone? <laughs> They'll uh, just send another one, won't they? <laughs> it's interesting, uh, interesting story. There's a lot of weird, weird angles in this one, but um, I would say, uh, I mean, the whole privacy thing, I think that is an issue, right? Right, with these drones. Like, I would not want a drone flying over my house watching. Yeah, if, even, you know, even if I knew it was my neighbor. Why are you doing that? You know what I mean? Come on, give me some neighbor. privacy. I'd probably be more okay if it was uh, like some kind of survey for the government or for the township or for Google Maps or something. But probably if my neighbor was watching me, I'd probably be more concerned about that because that's a little, yeah, it's a little it's like, weirder. Yeah, why are you doing that? Yeah, but the, the of perception thing. of drones, like, and you, you said that the guy flying it didn't actually have a camera built onto this drone. But the perception of them is such that everyone's going to assume that they've got these capabilities. Right. So, exactly. I mean, either you have to become an expert in, in is, that a, is that a camera on that thing that's flying 500 feet above me or not? You know, it, it becomes like you either have to be an expert in the technology or we have to figure out a societal way to, to figure out what's, what's good manners and bad manners when flying your, right. your remotely operated drone. I, th I think we're definitely at that point right now where that's being hashed out, you know, what's acceptable and what's not. Yeah. So. Right. I, I would personally... As soon as I saw a drone, I would think that there was a camera on it. And if it was 
anywhere near me. I, why are you watching me and who are you? Even if you are my neighbor, like you guys said, you know, it, stay away from me. I didn't ask for you to come over here with your drone. And, you know, the guy ended up assuming and shot it down, right. which I bet you was great fireworks. <laughs> I think it was. And pretty good aim probably too, right? Right. He got it from his property like two or three hundred feet away. And <laughs> See, now, if this guy was smart, like, you know, we were, instead of going right for the gun, you go for the computer, right? Like uh, Matthew McConaughey in, in uh, Interstellar there, where he brought the drones down, remember? Oh, and then he was yeah, yeah. using That's the parts right. or whatever. That would have been cool. <laughs> that been so that would, be, uh, that would be the angle I would work towards, is try to, like, bring it down myself and take possession of it or whatever and say, hey, you know, come sue me to get your drone back. <laughs> 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 Thanks for that. And uh, so let's uh, transition into the uh, internet weather. And there's a couple of interesting, I had some time this morning to do a little bit digging, not all the digging I wanted to do, but we've answered some, I've got some answers for a few questions at least, which I think we've been plaguing us for a little while on uh, some of these internet weather reports. Uh, so here's the, uh, uh, the internet weather for the most probe ports. This is the ones that have the most scanning activity by sheer volume, not necessarily by the number of people scanning, but just sheer volume of scan packets. In the top, as usual, that we've been seeing, 135 TCP. We're going to take a look at a chart on that and some other information I was able to collect. 23 TCP is also in there. We see a lot of scan sources doing that uh, in general, uh, as well as 22 TCP, which is SSH. Uh, 23 TCP being Telnet. I should mention what these are. 135 TCP is your endpoint mapper, DCE, RPC uh, for Microsoft protocol. Then 445 TCP, that could be like, you know, latent configure or other types of things exploiting that vulnerability in the Microsoft uh, SMB protocol there. And then uh, 80 TCP, 1433 TCP, which is Microsoft SQL Server. I didn't grab a chart on this because I think we've been seeing that kind of one sitting in this kind of um, uh, top 10 position and it's not really changing a whole lot. It's a pretty steady state amount of scanning activity on that one. 443 TCP, uh, which is your SSL, uh, 1900 UDP, which is Simple Service Discovery Protocol, which we've talked about quite a bit. It's being used a lot in uh, amplification attacks, similar to how DNS would get used, where you can spoof a packet and send it to a, a victim uh, target. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of that activity still. Uh, this is probably scanning activity, trying to identify SSDP reflectors that somebody could use as part of an attack. Uh, and then uh, the ICMP is probably uh, nothing to worry about. Those are just echo requests. And then 53 UDP is the DNS stuff. Um, so the first one I wanted to take a look at here is this 135 TCP, which is the endpoint mapper uh, DCE RPC locator service uh, used by Microsoft. It's not really used much anymore. And I think we, Brian might have mentioned on a previous show that we, we have observed that there's uh, a fair number of these that have a static source port of 4445, which might indicate that there's some kind of usage of something like, uh, what's mass the? Mass scan. Mass scan or mm -hmm. one of those kinds of tools, uh, potentially. Um, but I also noticed that there's another population of them, actually, that right now, maybe accounting for this large increase that we're seeing over the past seven days or so, it went from maybe 250,000 scan flows per hour up to 450,000. So it's almost a doubling, but not quite. The other group is using source port ranges of 1026 to 5,000, which in and of itself is kind of interesting because that tells me it's not a Linux machine. This is probably real old Windows machines, which I thought was interesting because old Windows machines used that port range as um, their ephemeral ports when they would make a connection. And the population is mostly from China and US. So it's kind of a mix there. So then I decided to take a little bit closer look. So both of these uh, groups, when you actually poke them on port 80, interestingly enough, they're running a very old version of internet uh, information server, uh, version 6.0. Uh, which shipped with Windows 2003 and Windows XP, the 64-bit version, which would be these old versions of Windows that would use that ephemeral port range, which kind of makes sense. And they're also listening on 135 TCP as well, which is also interesting. So maybe, maybe they're, I don't know, I didn't try to exploit them, but maybe they're vulnerable to those. There are some old vulnerabilities on 135 TCP. I don't remember what numbers they are. It's like MSO3, 
something something. I can't remember what what the vulnerability is. Um, but uh, it's potentially possible that maybe someone's found that there's some population of these out there that are still vulnerable and has something similar to the blaster worm running. This is all theoretical. All I can tell you is that I know these are really old Windows machines. They're running a really old version of IIS uh, from like 2003 timeframe, which is what, 12 years old? Uh, so that in and of itself is kind of strange. Um, and uh, when you actually hit their port 80, it just returns a under construction, you know, uh, IIS page in Chinese. They're all return a Chinese under construction, even the ones in the US. So interesting. Not sure what to make of it other than maybe we have a little bit more information to go on to say, oh, we kind of understand what these sorts of devices are, but why or how they're becoming infected or how they're, how they're manifesting. You know, is somebody setting up a really old version of Windows with IIS? I don't know, uh, to have you know, a significant population of them out there. Um, I wouldn't say it's like super significant. I'm not quite sure if I got a chart on how many devices we see, but it's probably like less than 500. So it's not like a giant population of them, but they're doing a lot of scanning. So on the this port. same 500 are scanning basically across the internet. Yeah, finding more? like everything from one dot whatever up to 255 dot whatever, 254 dot whatever. Wow. So uh, kind of interesting. Another one to follow. I tried to see if we had any packets in our uh, honey net to see if I could kind of get kind of samples of what it's trying to do, but I wasn't able to actually find any interactive uh, messages. Just, yeah, you know, I wasn't able to find any actual communication. So interesting uh, one to keep an eye on. I'm not quite sure what, what the motivation or what's behind it or why, why they're using this, or if this is, you know, I don't know if somebody's setting these up like this or if somebody found a bunch of these old Windows machines sitting out there. They do happen to sit in very, tight address blocks. So you'll see like at some internet service provider, you know, dot 10, dot 11, dot 12, dot 13, dot 14, dot 15, they're all the same kind of machine all doing this. So that is a little strange too. It'd be super weird if it was like, you know, cause, cause most internet worms never really die. There's always like a small population somewhere that never quite gets cleaned up. Mm -hmm. If that was the case that, you know, someone decided it was a good idea to bring a whole bunch of old XP boxes online because they were you could the licenses were cheap or something right. and all of a sudden you've created another you know right there's one blaster worm sitting out there and he finally found this whole group <laughs> of these new yeah. it's like he had a feeding frenzy a, a feast on all these vulnerable machines yeah. I don't know we're theorizing but yeah. it is interesting to think about if somehow that reminds me of Wally -E for some reason where like the one robot was on Earth by himself and then he found all these other robots I never saw the, the movie so. oh okay it's a cartoon <laughs> Good movie. Um, okay, uh, so I wanted to point that one out because I thought that was interesting. Um, and maybe we'll find out some more details uh, in the future on it. But uh, So in terms of the most sources probing, we talked about 23 TCP Telnet that's at the top, that's been at the top for a long time. It's a lot of these IoT, you know, Internet of Things type of devices, home routers, like we talked about, get compromised and so they start looking for more devices uh, on 23 TCP that they can compromise. 445 TCP is your SMB, 27015 UDP, that is gaming. That's probably gonna keep going up now that we're in summer vacation mode, all the kids are home and they're playing games. So Steam summer sale. Oh, Steam summer sale. That's that it. We'll see if we, we get to the number three position by next week, right? Uh, and then this 9101 UDP, which we've been talking about for uh, probably a couple of months now, maybe at least a month, I think. And we're gonna take a closer look at that one as well. Uh, some of this ICMP, I think, is probably not really uh, security relevant. And then the 17788 UDP, also in the top. I want to do a deeper dig for next week's show on this one, because I'm going to show you what I did for 9101 UDP. And then 1900 UDP, again, that's the SSDP uh, reflection type activity going on there. So the 23 TCP chart, I pulled a 180 day chart here. So it's basically half a year. I did that because I want to show that even though it's in the top position, the telnet scanning that's been going on in terms of the number of sources uh, involved, it's not nearly to the point that it was back in the early part of the year, 2015. So we were up around 150,000 scan sources at the peak here, whereas right now we're kind of hovering around 60 to 70,000, about half of that in terms of a peak volume. So it is still a lot of scans. That's a lot of scan sources for us to see. That's why it's in the number one position. Uh, but it's not nearly as bad as it was before. Not to say I'm going to diminish that 
I don't want this, you know, I'd like it to go away or I'd like to figure out how this can be solved because I know they're up to no good, these scan sources. But uh, uh, it's not as bad as it was. What's the, uh, the low point for those scans? I can't see the What's the here. The low point for the, because there's a, there's a trough in the middle where it looks like they had a, a small right. number. So down in the middle here, like in the March to early April time frame maybe, okay. there's a trough. I don't really have any accounting to explain that other yeah. than maybe whoever's running this was just busy with other things at that time and they just kind of let it kind of die off and now they resurging it again. I don't know. Mm. Um, I, I don't have an explanation for that, but uh, I'm trying did. to think of reasons why people would re be rebooting their routers in the March to April time frame. Oh, that's a good point too. Yeah, I don't know. It could be uh, related to that as well, but I don't know why that would be either. That's it. We're going to have to have a national holiday. Yeah, re reboot national router reboot day. day. Yeah, that would be. You know what? That would be re interesting if people actually followed it and they did it. I bet you we'd see a major change in the profile of scanning traffic. Um, that's a very interesting day. We have to see if we can push that through with Congress or something. Uh, <laughs> so then there's this 9101 UDP stuff, which is officially an IANA registered with Bacula Director. I can tell you this is not Bacula Director. This is a distributed hash table BitTorrent traffic. We've been talking about this that we've been seeing basically since it looks like May 30th. We saw before May 30th, we saw no scanning whatsoever on this, this port. And then it started to really creep up, um, up to the point now that it's, what is it, around 6,500, so around 6,000 to 6,500 scan sources. Not nearly as bad as Telnet that we were just looking at, but still not insignificant. And my question was, is what are they doing? Like, why, why all of a sudden 9101 UDP? I did get a chance to, um, oh, it's also mostly from Thailand and the U.S. I thought it was interesting that recently, I think, some of this, uh, the larger surge that we've had recently here is contributing a lot from Thailand. I didn't go back to the earlier to check it, but I can tell you right now, there's a lot of Thailand um, devices involved here. And um, uh, when I actually took all the info hashes, cause you know, it's DHT, DHT is a protocol where basically you spew out to the internet, hey, does anybody know how to find this file? And you, you ask for an info hash. And then if somebody knows, uh, first of all, you got to find somebody who's actually listening, right, on port 9101 UDP. And then if they are and they actually know where it is, they'll respond, hey, yeah, I know where this file is. You can talk to these eight peers that know something about this file. And then you talk to them and then you start getting the file uh, with the BitTorrent protocol. So um, it's kind of a way to, like, I guess, distribute, anonymize, or decentralize your uh, directory of probably illegally shared files <laughs> well, I mean, but, oh, <laughs> or legally too. Legally, yeah. yeah. Um, however, what I did is I took a list of all the info hashes that people were asking for and sharing in here. And uh, the majority are movie and music file sharing. So I kind of attribute this now to be benign stuff. I, did, I didn't write down all of them, but there were like TV shows and certain music and some other explicit type of file sharing going on but that would not be abnormal for BitTorrent. So, uh, you know, you could take those info hashes, go to like a BitTorrent tracker and look them up and see what those file names are. So I did that real quickly. I took like the top 30 and just kind of figured out what they were. So, um, so I thought that was interesting. I don't, I still don't have an answer. Like why 9101 UDP all of a sudden, other than maybe there's some, some new, client out there that yeah. uses that as a default port or something, but I'm not aware of it. So if anybody knows yeah. out there in internet land, or please let us know. A closed community where everyone agreed to use this as the port instead of right. for, for maybe evading, um, uh, what do you call it? Like um, if, if an ISP decides to block file oh, sharing ISP's activities blocking, like you change the port number, or something, they may not right. see it. Yeah. All right, could be. Looks like it's not very good at evading. So no. Well, yeah, it's very out. obvious to us, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I, I get your drift in that, you know, maybe some service providers might block 6881 UDP, which is like the well-known port for BitTorrent, but they're not blocking this or something. Um, but I was Is there any way to tell what time of day this this is? Because I'm, I'm looking at the chart and it almost looks like they're taking the weekends off. And it's almost, you know, maybe it's in business hours, so there's something else going on. I don't know. I'm just looking at the data and making stuff up? Um, well, I don't know if it's about a weekend off, but you see like the wave pattern here is really, yeah. it peaks in the, like what I have to look at the actual hour that it's occurring in there. 
but these are individual days here. So you're really seeing a daily pattern of peaking, sinking down, peaking, sinking down, peaking, sinking down hmm. again, um, and growing over time. It's kind of hard to see if there's any kind of dip during weekends or not, but I'd have to actually map out which ones are actual weekends on here. Well, that right, sense. I was looking at it, and the font's so small from what I'm seeing, it looked like a much longer time span, so the weekend theory's out. Yeah, no, I don't think that's the case here. I think you're just seeing kind of a daily diurnal type of pattern here uh, right now. So um, I'd like to do the same kind of thing um, with, uh, with that 17788 UDP that we're also seeing elevate. Uh, we're actually seeing a lot more uh, activity on that one we are than we are with this 9101, and we're also seeing it for a much longer period of time. So uh, when we looked at that, it is clearly, again, uh, DHT BitTorrent protocol. So maybe we can figure out if it's the same kind of thing happening. But still, I'd like to understand who, who and why they're deciding on these ports um, for, uh, for their discovery uh, in any event. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, maybe next week I'll try to get a better picture together of the types of files being shared, as long as it's not too naughty, uh, for lack of a better term. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's the show for today. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at attthreattrack at list.att.com. Uh, you can also find the ATT Threat Track program on the ATT Tech channel, and it's also available on YouTube and iTunes. Uh, please follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at ATT Security. Uh, thanks, Tony, for joining us, a special guest this week. Also, thank you, Matt and Stan. Uh, I'm John Hogaboom. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.